You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. I uh, duffly apologize for yesterday. After 720-ish odd episodes, I've kind of gotten a feel for when I probably just need to take a day off. I'm, I'm, I'm very prideful about the whole I want to do this every day thing, and I do a f- relatively good job. But every once in a while... I, it's going to be on a weekend when I sleep in. It's 8 o'clock. And I don't know, there's just something, there's, there's this weird 3 o'clock energy. I'm tired and miserable, but when I sit down in this chair, I'm super jacked up to get started and talk to everybody. When I sleep in, you would think I'd be in a good mood. It's the exact opposite. I feel refreshed, but I also feel like I hate all of you. I don't know what it is. It's weird. I just, I just don't want to talk to you. I don't want you in my house. You're all sitting around here waiting for me to talk to you. It's like, I don't want to. I want to eat, I don't know, breakfast again. I watch TV. And so there was a time in which I would force myself and say, nope, we're doing every day. And the podcast would take four hours because I'm just not into it. And I would be deleting a bunch of stuff. And I would just, you would just feel the whole, I'm not into this. And I don't want to waste news with my whole thing going on. I'm not a good actor and pretending that I'm interested, probably just not going to be very good at that. So we took Sunday off is what I'm getting at. But I'm back, and sure enough, that whole 3 o'clock energy, man, Fe- feeling good. Feeling good. So um, decent amount of, F- of <laughs> I almost said energy, do have that. Decent amount of news, and the best news of all, some of you might disagree, I don't care, supposedly, and things are changing by the hour, as you may or may not have noticed. But supposedly, um, the new league year is starting as planned. And I can tell you, I'm all on board for that. I've seen a couple people say, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. But again, let's try to keep a little perspective here. The goal isn't we just need to shut down the world and mourn. We just need to stop touching each other's faces for a little while, right? It's just, it's all good. Just stop poking people in the mouth. And just, you know, you knock that off for a little while, we'll be all right. I understand it's, the urge is there. Just telling you to back off for a little bit of time. It's probably a little easier for us introverts than some of the extroverts out there who are shaking in their houses. I don't know what to do. I need a play date. But you'll be all right. So uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully everything stays the same. And in a matter of a couple days, one of the greatest weeks couple weeks in the entire football year is about to happen. You've got, I mean, the football season is great, but in terms of like moments of awesomeness, there's probably the draft picks, right? Where it's just in a moment, it's this amazing, like, oh, they did this. And then there's free agency, which is just a beautiful thing. And it's about to happen. So get excited. I did, it better happen because I'm getting, it would be like, for me anyways, and I'm guessing for a lot of you, it would be like telling the kids on Christmas Eve, like, hey, we're going to bump it back a week. Don't do that to the kids, man. The kids need Christmas. Don't give me this Santa Claus might get sick stuff. Tell the fat man to get in his sleigh and give me my presents. All right, Goodell? I want my Ninja Turtles, and I want them now. So that's where we're at. Does all that make sense to you? Do you are you following me, or... Is, there, is anybody there? I don't know. Speaking of is anybody there, I had a little theory. And the theory went something like this. Around this time, the listenership tends to fall off a little bit, and it has been. But I thought, I wonder what happens in certain places where people tend to stay home a little bit. In the United States, almost 2,000 less people listened last week than the week prior to that. It's a fairly sizable drop-off, especially for a week. I, you know. However, throughout Europe... There's, there seems to be a precipitous spike. So big shout out to all my uh, peeps out in the UK, Germany, Brazil, by the way. I don't know if that has anything to do with what's going on, but uh, I do love Brazil. 
just a huge population of Packer fans out there. It's always been one of the biggest audiences for this show. Mexico, New Zealand, people in the Netherlands just hate me this past week. Denmark, too. I don't know what's going on up there, but apparently they canceled all podcasts. Spain, doubled. What up, Spain? China, what's up? I'm just shouting out all the countries that have, there's been a spike over the last week. Korea, wow. About 4x spike. Welcome to the show, Korea. Dominican Republic, Czech Republic, all the republics, welcome. Russian Federation, I literally don't even know what that is. Is that just Russia? What is the Russian Federation? Is that like a starship? Like the Starship Enterprise? Is that like your space force? Well, either way, welcome. Belgium, Jamaica. I almost did a Jamaican thing, but I, I, I don't want to lose the extra listeners. As well as brand new listeners in Indonesia, Philippines, Bahamas, and Lebanon. Welcome to the party. I used to do stuff like that more often, but the new hosting company doesn't have this information, so I have to get it from somewhere else. But um, yeah, shout out to the peeps around the world. Because I free- I can't even keep it straight that not everybody lives in Wisconsin, much less that there's an international audience. So I apologize, and I want to say hi once in a while. Hello. Anyways, if you find folks, anybody that I uh, listed off in these beautiful countries would like to join in on the Packernet podcast, we'd love to have you. Make sure you also like the Packernet Podcast Facebook page. If you'd like to support the show, leave five-star iTunes reviews, Stitcher review, some kind of review anywhere, just saying, hey, thumbs up, good show. Otherwise, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. Why don't we take a break and we'll uh, talk about some of the latest and greatest news and information. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, Do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so first of all, as you know, the CBA did pass as was expected. It was pretty close, and obviously some people are unhappy about it, but I think aside from the fact that we don't have to worry about a stoppage, one of the best things is that we don't have to go through this again. And as much as I think a 10-year agreement is a little silly from pretty much everybody's perspective, um, at least we don't have to deal with this nonsense but once every 10 years. So, And I, I don't think it's ever going to be different than this, to be completely honest. This is just what a negotiation is. We deserve more. Well, you're not getting more. But I want it. Well, too bad. Take it or leave it. Fine, we'll take it. Ah, why did you take it? That was terrible. We should have got more, even though we can't, because they would never accept it. And then we kick and scream, and then we go back and play football. But it did pass. The final vote was 1,019 to 959, so it was pretty pretty, pretty split. Roughly 2,000 out of the 2,500 members voted. So also, the vast majority of people that are in the union did vote. As far as information, apparently it's not... 100% known, which is weird. You would think that what you agreed to was an agreement. (laughs) 
and and we would know the details, but apparently not 100% of the details we know. However, we know that you're only getting one franchise or transition tag, which is, you know, kind of expected. We talked about that, I don't know, a week ago or whatever. The idea that some teams were planning on using two because that was part of the old agreement that in the final year you could use two tags, a franchise and a transition, but more than likely it was going to be overruled by the new CBA, which is now in effect, that says you can only use one. I don't think anybody actually used it, which, as I said, I don't understand what the purpose of that would have been anyways. But that's going back to normal. There are $700 million more dollars currently for the 2020 season, including a $100,000 increase in minimums. All told, apparently the new salary cap is going to be $198.2 million, which is a little bit less than was anticipated, which means all teams are getting less. Um, that kind of stinks a little bit, because obviously the more money means the more we can spend, et cetera, et cetera. However, less money is much more impactful to the teams that are not responsible with their salary cap than teams that are responsible. Right? It's kind of like, and this may be a sensitive topic at this particular time, but when times are bad, the people that are responsible with their money and maybe set a little bit aside for a rainy day instead of going out neating and spending money on stuff you don't need are going to be a little bit better off. It's nice to have a little bit of a rainy day fund. And so teams like the Packers, who aren't necessarily flush with cash, but are sufficiently stacked with cash, a $2 million swing, not that big of a deal. If you're, say, the Vikings, and you're trying to squeeze every little penny you can and you find out you're two million dollars less than anticipated it's a little bit more frustrating it's another two million dollars you got to find somewhere and so both spot track and um, over the cap have come out with estimates based on what they currently understand because there's some nuance in terms of what money can be put where and and whatnot and i'm not even going to attempt to try to dive in i'll let the experts do that the experts in this case in my opinion are spot track and over the cap and so there are slight variations, but let's look at it uh, for what it currently is. As of right now, Spot Track has the Detroit Lions as the only NFC North team that is above the league average. The league average is $40 million in cap space. Obviously, that's thrown off a little bit by teams like the Dolphins, who have $91 million in cap space. But this is essentially what we've got. We've got the Detroit Lions at $48.5 million. Over the cap has them at basically $48 million. So somewhere in that range. And then in order for the NFC North, the Green Bay Packers are 22nd in terms of cap space, sitting where they usually do at about $22.6 million. Over the cap has them at about $22.8. Basically no real difference there. Followed closely by the Chicago Bears, who we talked about a couple days ago as having significantly more money than they did in the past. Rated right about $21 million. Over the cap, vehemently disagrees with that and says they have about $8.6 million. So there must be some gigantic move that was made that there's a massive difference between. I don't really understand. Maybe it's because I've been looking at over the cap that I thought the Bears had less. I don't know. But that, that'll that be interesting to know why. Maybe I can... They've got a difference of $5 million in cap spending. I don't know. That's a weird one. We'll have to kind of wait Maybe there's a couple of finalized or unfinalized things that'll come into play uh, soon enough, I suppose. But that's a, like I said, that's a giant difference between uh, 21 and 8 million. And no, I have no interest in going through and trying to figure it out myself. And then you have the Vikings, depending on who you believe. Again, over the cap has them at 8 million, which means the Vikings technically, according to them, have more. According to over the cap, they have about 13 and a half million, which is just about enough to go into the season. Because again, you want maybe eight to ten million on hand after you sign your draft picks. So if they do nothing else, they should be okay to make it. However, obviously, there's still a ton of free agents to be signed and everything else that's going on. So a lot of things that need to be come into focus over the next couple of days. I just just even thinking about it gets me super excited. I mean, even 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 if the Packers don't do much, it's just an exciting time. Like I've said, the 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 NFL in a lot of ways, is a soap opera for dudes. Sorry for the four women listeners that I have, but let's just call it what it is. And this is like, you know, well, it's it's the season opener. It's a, literally what it is. You know, the, the best shows typically are the first one and then especially the last one, which in this case would be the Super Bowl. By the way, uh, Spot Track has the Vikings at about 16.5 million, so again, relatively close. There's probably the most agreement on the Green Bay Packers and what they have going on. 
probably because of all the movement. You've seen Detroit, Minnesota, Chicago make a lot of cuts and movement around, so there's some disagreement on exactly how that all pans out. And I don't think that's going to come into focus anytime soon because it's just going to get crazier. But, you know, eventually the dust will settle and we'll get a little bit of a better picture on that. But, again, as for the Packers, um, fairly solid consensus, 21 22-ish million dollars they're sitting on. Uh, but even that doesn't say much because that number could skyrocket if we, you know, end up either cutting players or the big one would be extending players. As I've said, a David Bakhtiari extension could free up about $8 million in cap space. I mean, that's that's a signing. I don't even think re-signing um, Brian Balaga would cost in terms of cap dollars this year. I don't even know if he would cost $8 million. If we signed him at 12, it would maybe, I, I don't remember exactly the numbers. I don't feel like pulling it up, but it's probably in and around eight-ish million dollars in terms of cap hit this year. So that would pretty much be a wash. So it'll be interesting to see what they end up doing as far as moving pieces around. And they may end up just waiting on some of these things to find out how free agency goes. If they take swings at, say, Littleton and a few other people and end up getting none of them, then yeah, just sign all your guys back. The, the issue is you got to worry about possibly losing Balaga as you're over here trying to court all these other people and then Balaga ends up signing elsewhere that could be somewhat problematic but I don't know and again as a refresher because we have some of these things coming up our free agents include Brian Balaga which I am getting every day that goes by closer to 50 percent that he's not coming back it doesn't super make sense to me but again this is this is Green Bay Packers cap management 101 you've got a 30 plus year old offensive lineman looking for a third contract that's still got some left in the tank, but probably not much left. This is just textbook. We're going to let him walk. Everyone's going to freak out, and it'll end up not being that big of a deal in terms of Balaga going somewhere else and not being very productive. Sounds silly, but, um, you know, maybe. Uh, Tremont Williams is another one, 37 years old. I like Tremont. I want Tremont back. At some point, you got to do the hard thing and let the guy walk away. His average salary was about $5 million. He's probably going to want at least that to come back. It's, it's not a huge amount for a corner that's as good as he was, but it's still $5 million. Jared Valdir, a lot of people super excited about Jared Valdir. But again, he's 33 years old. He just retired. He's got a taste for it. And beyond that, you had somebody like the Patriots bring him in, and then Valdir's like, eh, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore and leave. Injuries or not, that concerns me. I don't want a guy that, could, that I could sign and then just at, on a whim says, you know what, I'm just... I'm, after going through all this training and everything, I've got enough money. I'm just going to walk away. Uh, you've got Geronimo. That's honestly a relatively tough decision. I would rather not have him back. I'm assuming they're going to do enough in free agency and uh, and the draft to replace him. But you start cutting all your wide receivers, and you're you're relying on a lot of unproven talent to come in and produce. And again, as, as much as Geronimo wasn't great, he's our only slot guy right now. Uh, Mercedes Lewis. Similar situation. I, I have no real desire to pay the man $2 million to stick around. He wasn't super productive. I know Rodgers really likes him. I understand he's a leader. But, you know, 36 years old. Come on now. Uh, Jason Spriggs, I have been on record saying I'd like to keep him. I'm probably the only person, and probably including some of the Green Bay Packers uh, themselves, the leadership. I just want to see where it's going. He's only 26 years old. He was a second-round pick. His best work came... The last time we saw him, in other words, that would denote some form of improvement. I'd just be interested to throw a million or two bucks at him and see if, uh, you know, see how it goes. Ryan Grant, I don't care. He never even set foot on the field, so whatever. Kyler Fackrell, I do think, is probably going to go away. I know that seems silly, especially what I said before about him taking over for Rashawn Gary. In other words, taking more and more snaps away from him. However, you don't go out in free agency and spend big money on two pass rushers, and then spend the number 12 overall pick, and also re-sign Kyler Fackrell to, even if it's not a bunch of money, the, the reason you do all that is so that you don't need to pay guys like Kyler Fackrell. Now, you, you do need some players, but again, it's it's how much money does, does he want? The point is, you, you can't squeeze the Packers for any edge rusher money. They're just going to say no, no matter what. I mean, if he's going to take a, a bare minimum contract, maybe, but you know, at 21, at 28 years old, I just, I would guess it's not going to pan out. Uh, BJ Goodson is a, you know, we got to figure out what to do. I'm assuming we're going to pay him because we don't have any linebackers. We got Ibrahim Campbell, which, you know, is a guy I'd like to bring back. 
I thought he was a good player when he was around. It's obviously going to, again, depend on what the Packers' plans are at safety. We spent money and a draft pick, first-round draft pick at safety. So, again, that's a situation where they're not going to be squeezed for a lot. But I don't think he's going to command a lot. Tyler Irvin, I'm guessing, is going to stick around because he was relatively productive. Blake, we all assume, is going to be gone. Malcolm Johnson, the fullback, I mean, whatever. I don't expect too much. Robert Tanyan will probably be back just because I don't see who else. I mean, aside from Jace, we just don't have anybody currently on the roster. The only guy we had next to Jace that was a tight end, we just cut. Everybody else is a free agent. So, uh, Jay Kumaro, again, similar to um, Geronimo. Do you want to keep him or get rid of him? I know in the past we've kept all these guys, but in the past we also haven't really put a lot of effort into bringing in wide receivers. And so we needed to stitch together the Kumaros and the Geronimos and all the O's to try to make a actual team. But if we're going to go kind of all in at wide receiver, you could start to see guys like Kumaro and Geronimo go bye-bye. But again, the problem is we haven't had the draft yet. We don't know what's going to happen. So if you get rid of them and we don't come away with wide receivers, we just don't have anybody. So I kind of would expect at least one of those guys to come back. Uh, Chandon Sullivan, Tyler Lancaster... Tyler's probably going to stay. He's not the greatest, but as far as guys that are decent against the run, rotational guys, you know. And again, you could say, well, we should upgrade. Well, how many upgrades do you think we can do? How many draft picks do you think we have? How much cap space do you think we're going to go all in on wide receiver? we got to go out and get tight ends. we we got to get offensive linemen and, and tackles. And if you assume we can get maybe one or two free agents and maybe we'll have two players out of this draft that can come in and start and play really well, You tell me which positions those are going to be. You get one free agent and two positions we can upgrade. Is defensive tackle going to be one of them? I'm just asking. You know, whatever. Because I know it's easy for a lot of people. Oh, he should just be replaced. We can't replace every single person. So my guess, he sticks around. Uh, Will Redmond, I, you know, I don't know. Again, just depends on how things go. Alan Lazard is going to be the one that uh, he made himself a decent chunk of money. This was... Primo. I mean, there's 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 a decent enough chance he's still our wide receiver too. I hope he's not, not because I have anything against Alan Lazard, but because we do something massive and get a really good wide receiver, whether that's in the draft or somebody in free agency that really just pans out. And so Alan Lazard ends up being sort of a, a solid number three, four option, whatever. But again, no guarantees. So zero question that 24 year old Alan Lazard is going to get some money. And then finally, John Leglue. I you know whatever. So that is just a refresher of the guys that are currently free agents that we have to make decisions on. And again, with very little money, there's a lot of tough decisions that I think are going to be made, especially these guys in the mid to late 30s. I just, I don't know. I think those are going to be sort of those tough decisions that are I'm not going to be happy about, but I completely understand. Anyways, that's it for the League New Year information. There was also a flurry of things getting done. Uh, we saw Friday was the day of cuttings. Sunday seemed to be the day of trades and signings. And one of the bigger developments is that Tom Brady is kind of running out of options. And this is one of the reasons why teams sometimes just let a person go test the market. Because usually teams hear a demand and then they say, eh, I don't, not only do are we not going to offer you that, we don't think you're going to get that anywhere else. So rather than sit here and pound the table and try to negotiate, we're just going to let you go test the market and see what you come back with. Tom Brady's been out testing the market and apparently there's not a whole lot of interest left. There was some talk about some crazy trade possibly with the 49ers. That apparently is no longer a thing. I don't know if it was ever a thing, but that's apparently a shut door. The Titans just went out and extended Ryan Tannehill, which I don't see why that would be a bad decision. I understand a lot of people looking at it going, dude, it's Tannehill. But, dude, I, 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 I don't know. If it's me, I'm not judging Tannehill based on what he was able to do in Miami. I'm looking at a quarterback that was able to do what he did for us and realize that even if it doesn't work everywhere it works for us and what we do so he's our guy he might not be the guy he's not ever going to be this elite talent but we've got a window we are knocking on the door of a super bowl why in the world do you just let a quarterback walk that's generally my perspective because you're basically throwing in the towel and saying forget it we'll start from scratch for a team that has never been much of anything for a very long time the titans have just they're just not great and obviously they've tried to get quarterback. They've played out this tan or the uh, the Mariota thing for a very long time. They're, they're I don't know. It just makes sense to me. So they gave him a four-year deal worth 118 million dollars. 
Good for Tannehill, by the way. The guy, I'm sure, has made plenty of money over the years, but he kind of had to feel like things were winding down. He would probably make some money as a backup for a while. And in one year, he just gets, you know, by his standards, I suppose, a mega contract. So it was pretty close to $30 million a year average. $62 million fully guaranteed. He probably didn't think he'd get another $62 million out of this league. It was also $91 million total guaranteed, but 62 or fully. I don't, I don't know exactly how that works. I suppose if he's completely done done, like if he walks away, he doesn't get the 91 or something. I don't know. But big payday for uh, Mr. Tannehill. Probably the biggest news which sent Twitter into a tailspin was the fact that Calais Campbell got traded from the Jacksonville Jaguars to the Baltimore Ravens for a fifth-round pick, and everybody lost it. And this is this happens every single year. We overvalue players, we undervalue draft pick, and we completely forget that the salary comes into play here. So essentially the way I'm, I'm viewing this is the Jacksonville Jaguars were going to be done with Calais Campbell. They're not going to pay him. But rather than cut him, just like you do with everybody, you try to find a trade partner. Essentially, there was almost no interest. And they were probably very close to cutting him, and the best deal they could get was a fifth-round pick. And we see this all the time with guys that just end up getting cut. And you say, well, why didn't you trade him? Be- I'm sure they tried. Nobody was interested. And that seems just completely unfathomable to a lot of us fans because we think, well, what's the—I mean, we're willing to give up like third, second, third-round picks for guys like Calais Campbell. And so when this happens, even though it happens over and over and over and over again, we act like we don't understand. Now, granted, this is a little bit unusual considering he's still one of the top pass rushers in football right now. But, I, you know, you have to factor in his age. You also have to factor in the amount of money. And that's sort of the thing. A, a player has a certain value, and you're going to give him that full value. So the question is, how much do you want to overpay in terms of a draft pick? Because you're going to give him exactly what he's worth in terms of a contract. So how much are you willing to overpay to bring him to your team? And apparently, which is a little bit surprising, a fifth-round pick was all anybody was willing to give up. That that should really go to show, in large part, how much age plays into this. Because obviously, if he was 25, 26 years old and putting out this much, I mean, we'd be talking about a whole different situation. Because even the contract wasn't that mad. They, the, the Ravens only gave him a two-year deal for $27 million, so 13 and a half per year. Beyond that, I think one of the the big knocks against Calais Campbell is that he's an edge rusher whose main attribute is his ability to stop the run. He's not a bad pass rusher at all. He's a solid pass rusher, especially in terms of pressures. But, you know, you're looking at a 33-and-a-half-year-old guy who walked away with six sacks, and his official numbers, let me look it up. I'm guessing it's lower. No, it's higher, six-and-a-half. How is PFF lower? That's weird. Anyways, roughly six-ish sacks is what he came away with. So, I, you know, again, we can sit around and say so-and-so, stu- you know, this is why the Jaguars are terrible, blah, blah, blah. What, what did, I don't even understand what the Jaguars did wrong. Unless this is like a, a failure of negotiation, I, I just, but even that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because teams don't care how good of a negotiator you are. They just care about wanting to get a player. And if he was worth a fourth-round pick, there are 30 other teams, excluding the Baltimore Ravens and the Jaguars, obviously, that have the ability to offer up a fourth-round pick to get Calais Campbell. Apparently, zero of those 30 were willing to do it. So I don't know how we can trash the Jaguars for that. They got as much value as they could, just nobody wanted them. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people wanted them, but nobody was willing to offer more than the Baltimore Ravens' fifth-round pick for him. So I don't think this is necessarily a Jaguars failure as much as a maybe misunderstanding of how much the league values Calais Campbell and the fact that the Jaguars got as much as they possibly could out of this. So it's, it's definitely more beneficial to the Ravens than the Jaguars. And, and I think the bigger failing is the fact that the Jaguars have so mismanaged their own cap they can't keep Calais Campbell. That would be the biggest problem, especially if you you got a premier edge rusher that's only asking for a two-year deal worth $27 million and you can't pony that up because you've been so reckless with your cap. That would be your failing. But only getting a fifth, that's not even up to the Jaguars. That's up to what the market is, and unfortunately the market is cold on Calais Campbell. So, Anyways, why don't we take a break right there. We'll come back. We'll talk about some other stuff, including some rumors regarding the Green Bay Packers. So finally, that brings us to the Green Bay Packers rumors, and, and basically it's what we've been hearing all along, and obviously some of it is silliness, but even the non-silliness seems to be pointing in the same direction. So Rick Tafur. I guess is how you say his name, from The Athletic. 
He covers the Raiders and the NFL for the Athletic. He says he is hearing, and again, I don't 100% know what that means, but I'm assuming he knows well enough not to say I'm hearing, as in I've been reading articles from people that have no idea what they're talking about. He's hearing that there are two teams in on Corey Littleton which I'm sure is, is, that's not what he said. So let me just read the tweet because that's a misrepresentation. Here's what, what he said exactly. Hearing the Raiders and Packers are going to be all over free agent linebacker Corey Littleton when, if the free agent tampering window officially opens tomorrow. He is a popular target, which is something that I probably should mention. Wednesday is the day, I believe at four o'clock. I don't know if that's central time or East, probably Eastern time. That's the day these things officially happen. However, the legal tampering window is the day when phone calls can start being made, which the exciting thing about that is hopefully, no guarantees, but hopefully teams like the Packers are going to be making lots of phone calls, talking to agents, make, doing all this stuff. That's when rumors start flying. When we start seeing Ian Rappaport saying, I'm hearing these teams, these are the, in other words, these are the four teams calling about this player, this team, da, 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 and the Packers. When we get all those types, that's usually in this little window here. Um, now, back to what Vic had said. Did I say Rick or Vic? I feel like I said Rick. His name is Vic Tafur, Tafur, whatever. Tafer. Topher. I don't know. It sounds like what he's saying, not so much as that there's only two teams interested, because that would be ridiculous. There's going to be a lot of teams interested. What he's saying is there are two teams that are very interested, and that would be the Raiders and the Packers. Now, it's been pointed out, the obvious fact that the Raiders have a lot more money, but that's that's not really the point. The only reason that would matter is if the Raiders are more willing to overpay. Right, Both teams, every team has a certain value that they feel like they want to pay Littleton. So, for example, if we look back at the, what we did with Zadarius Smith, it's not that the Packers had more money than everybody else. It was just that they were willing to pay more than everybody else. I'm sure there were other teams that wanted them that had a lot more money. They just didn't see that as a good value. Now, the Packers have less money to do that with, but again, if we're looking at Corey Littleton, according to the spot track market value, about $12.2 million, it might be way more than that. I don't know. But let's say it's $12 million, and we use the same figure and say that three quarters of which end up being the actual cap hit. If $12 million is the value and both the Packers and the Raiders are the most willing to overpay and the Raiders are willing to pay 13 and the Packers are willing to pay 14 essentially that's about a $10 million cap hit for the Packers, which is a lot, and it would actually probably be a little bit less than that. If you say it's about two thirds, then it would be a little less than a little over nine million dollars. So it's not a matter of they're going to bid until the Packers just don't have money anymore, because they're not going to pay Corey Littleton twenty million dollars just because they have the money to throw around. Nobody is going to do that. Now you can overpay in free agency, absolutely. That's kind of the name of the game, but it's 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 still within parameters, and it still depends on value. So it's it's not so much who has the most money; it's more who values him the most. That's what's ultimately going to matter. If the Packers have it in their mind, they want to go after him. They've already allocated a certain amount of money for him. Then it comes down to negotiating, you know, trying to convince him that he would rather play in Green Bay than for the Oakland Raiders, which if winning a Super Bowl matters to him even a little bit, he probably wants to come to Green Bay. There's also the structure. Now, from what I understand, players don't usually like the structure that the Packers use. I haven't heard that about the Packers. There was another team. It might even be the Raiders, actually. There's another team that, that uses a similar structure that apparently is very frowned upon by players, which I don't understand, and that's the one in which you get a massive um, signing bonus. Maybe it's because the longevity of the contract isn't so isn't really there. In other words, you burn up all the guarantees in the signing bonus so that it, within a couple of years we can cut you if we want to. However, that means you get a massive infusion of cash. So just, I mean... I don't, I don't remember exactly the percentages, but if it's on average $14 million a year, say it's a five-year contract, or let's just call it four, that's $56 million. Let's say they guarantee, I don't know, $40 million of that, and they give them a, jeez, I don't remember what all the, let's call it a 20, $25 million signing bonus. That's, I mean, that's whatever it is, that would be cold, hard cash. Granted, it's all taxed, and it's, you know, it's going to take a big hit. But regardless of how it's dispersed, this amount of money is going to be taxed at about the same rate anyways. We're splitting hairs when we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. But that would be, you know, a 26-year-old getting $25 million check cut out to him. And then in addition to that, his, his base salary, which is going to be pretty low in that first year. A couple, but he's going to get a couple million dollars on top of that and bonuses and everything else. But that, that's another negotiating aspect. How much can we offer in terms of the structure? And I, I, I feel like that would be an enticement. Maybe it's frowned upon because you want that, you know, 
long-term security. But, I mean, the, the guarantees are what the guarantees are. You're going to get that anyways. The fact that after two years it's all burned up and we can cut Corey Littleton with, with basically no impact, same with Zedarius, same with Preston. These guys that we signed, if, if, if after two years it's not working out, the, the, the guarantees are basically all burned out and we can cut you and it's probably, for the most part, no cap hit. I mean, if that's your biggest concern, maybe this isn't the most desirable. But again, you get a lot of money right now. So I, I don't know. If, if it's me, take the money. Again, if, if, if it's about being intelligent with your, your finances, why wouldn't you want the infusion of cash you can invest it? I don't want it trickled. It's like if you win the lottery, do you want it dispersed or do you want lump sum? Everyone says don't take the Yes, take the lump sum. Just don't be stupid about it. Take the lump sum and invest it. So I don't know. I don't really understand why it's generally frowned upon the Packers don't seem to be having issues get bringing people in with that structure but I had heard a different team uh talk about I, th- I thought it was the Raiders which would help us a lot because if there's anything negative about the structure th- I mean it's it's a wash but anyways those would be the the issues and again it's not just as simple as whoever has the most money gets whoever they want the the bigger problem I think for a lot of teams is the teams with the most money are generally the teams that are the most garbage and so players don't really want to go there as much um, as far as Austin Hooper is concerned, again, there's a lot of silliness and things that aren't necessarily report, but there are enough reports that, I don't know, kind of a where there's smoke, there's fire. There is a report, which seems more reporty than than not. I, I have no way of knowing, because I don't know where these people are getting their sources. Again, if they're getting their sources from Roto World, which gets their sources from, you know, articles written by Bleacher Report listing what I would do if I was the Packers, that's not helpful. But supposedly there are three teams right now that are planning on bidding on Austin Hooper, uh, the Green Bay Packers being one of them, the other two being the Chicago Bears and the Washington Redskins. Um, obviously the the Packers have a leg up. They have Aaron Rodgers. They are in and around Super Bowl contenders. If I mean, if, if, if we're talking about the Bears, the Redskins, and the Packers are the ones offering the money that you want, there's only one team that should be considered a Super Bowl contender. Right, they're 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 not the Baltimore Ravens, they're not the Kansas City Chiefs, but they're at least knocking on the door. They have Aaron Rodgers. Also, there's the Matt Lafleur connection. I know there was a lot of talk about how Austin Hooper was talking them up, but you got to understand that I'm not putting any stock in that either. Again, I hate to be the curmudgeon of everybody, but when you're asked the question, "What are your thoughts on Matt Lafleur?" What do you expect him to say? Essentially, his quote was, "I don't know. I didn't really work with him because he was the quarterback coach, but he's a great guy and he helped me out a lot." And everyone's going, oh, look, he says he loves the Packers. He's definitely coming. No, he was asked a question. What, what? Again, the standard should be, what did he say compared to what would you expect him to say? Unless your expectation for him was would be to say, eh, I don't know, he's kind of a jerk. In a free agency period where you're trying to sell yourself and make a bunch of money, I feel like talking up everybody makes the most sense. And I'm sure he was asked a lot of other questions about a lot of other teams, and guess what he said about every other team? Exact same thing. If you were to ask him about the Chicago Bears, would he, oh, I, I, you know, great city, great fan base. I, I don't know what else you could try to pull out. I mean, even that was, both of those are a lie. I guess if you wanted to say something honest, you could say great pizza. Portillo's is good. <sighs> um, big city. It's next to Lake Michigan. Um, they have the best wind. I, I don't know. But the point is, you can come up with something positive for everything. Washington. I forget it. I'm not even going to try Washington. That's why I would end. Why ever? Not even going to take a run at that one. But I'm sure you could get coached up on a couple positives for every city and team and and oh, figure something out. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting. And again, hopefully, 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 we start hearing stuff as soon as this uh, window opens or people wake up and start making phone calls whenever that is. Do I expect the Packers to get both? No, I don't. I don't think it's really in the cards in terms of money to get Littleton and Hooper, the two of the biggest free agents out there for a team that has 20-some-odd million dollars. I don't see it, but I, I, I kind of am leaning toward they are going to end up getting one of them. Gutekunst is very, very aggressive. I mean, they're, they're coming away with somebody, and maybe there's a little bit of smoke, but I, I don't know. We'll find out. I, I also saw somewhere the Packers might be interested in Taylor Gabriel. Obviously, I'm not super excited about that. We've had plenty of guys that have speed and can't do anything else, and that is the definition of Taylor Gabriel, so I'm hoping that's not exactly true. Again, as I've said, if you want a Taylor Gabriel type, I'm looking at Brashad Perriman. Maybe he's going to cost too much money, I don't know, but that would be my preference over a guy like Taylor Gabriel. I understand that you want speed, but again, how many guys have we had that have speed but can't do a single thing else? But anyways, 
Hopefully we'll have a bunch of news tomorrow. That's going to be it for today. I hope you folks have yourselves a fantastic Monday. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.